Welcome to the Sports Playbook, where we discuss solutions to issues that impact sports. I'm your host, Angela Hazlett. Today's guest is Rob Taylor, the head coach for Auburn University men's wheelchair basketball team and the U.S. men's national wheelchair basketball team. We are here to discuss wheelchair basketball, collegiate and national team competition. Let's get to it. Welcome, Rob. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you very much for having me on today. Rob, we ha you have a really interesting background, so I'd love for you to, to tell us what led to your current role as head coach of the Auburn University men's wheelchair basketball team and also the head coach of the U.S. men's national wheelchair basketball team. Those are two pretty important, prominent positions. So how did you get where you are today? Yeah, you, you got some time. Uh, it, it can be a long time. story. Yeah, great. <laughs> we got time. Let's do it. <laughs> Uh, so my journey in, in adaptive sports and wheelchair basketball has been about 20 years. Uh, started out as uh, uh, really got into adaptive sports because of my uncle, Jim Taylor, who played wheelchair basketball in the Chicagoland area. Uh, he coached a, a women's team in the Chicagoland area as well. And, and as a young kid, I would go to his practices and kind of help out and jump in a chair and shag balls and, and rebound and, and help out wherever I could. Uh, then went to, to school at the University of Illinois uh, and introduced myself to the head coach of the team there and, and got involved with, with that program there and slowly worked my way up from towel boy and, and water boy uh, to assistant coach of, of both the men and the women's team that they had on campus there. Um, the following graduation, this is where it kind of diverges into two different paths, one that leads to the U.S. team and one that leads to Auburn. Uh, so I'll go the Auburn path first. Uh, after graduating from the University of Illinois, I uh, moved out to Arizona and started working with a women's team, a women's wheelchair basketball team, the Phoenix Mercury. I coached them for a couple of years. Um, my wife and I had started a family out there and we wanted to move back to Chicago. So we moved back to Chicago and I started coaching uh, a juniors team or a high school team in the Chicagoland area, the Windy City Warriors. Um, and then after coaching that team for a few years, the Auburn opportunity opened up and I was able to land the job here at Auburn. And, and, and this is where kind of the U.S. team plays into that. So while I was at the University of Illinois, I helped out with uh, the U.S. women's Paralympic team and, and was kind of uh, the stat boy for them and, and helped out and did a number of uh, a different tasks that were needed to help help the team prepare for. At that time, it was the games in Athens in 2004. Um, after the Athens game, uh, an assistant coaching position became available. So I uh, I applied and was named assistant coach of the U.S. women in 2005 and served that role through the Beijing Games in 2008 and was uh, proud to be part of that team that won a gold medal with the women in Beijing. Uh, following those games, um, there was a, a point where I took some time off away from the U.S. program and then came back as an assistant coach with the men and have been uh, with the men since 2013. Served in an assistant coach role from 13 through the Tokyo Games. Uh, and again, very proud of the fact that we won a gold medal in Rio with the men in 2016. And then followed that up with another gold in Tokyo uh, last year in the postponed 2020 Games. Uh, and it was through my involvement with the U.S. team that Auburn found out about me. And actually, it was uh, a teammate of my uncle's from college that had let Auburn know uh, that I was uh, an up-and-coming coach or a coach that was interested in getting back into the college ranks. Uh, and that's how those paths kind of converged again. So I've been here at Auburn now for, we're in the middle of my seventh season. Um, and also along the way, uh, after this past year, the head coach from the U.S. team decided to step down uh, and I got promoted to the head coach of the U.S. team. So right now it's balancing two different teams, which fortunately happened in uh, two different parts of the year. Although with COVID, it has kind of put a wrench in the U.S. team in terms of when we qualify and when we play. So there's a little bit of overlap right now. Uh, but it's been a long journey, uh, taking me a number of different places, taking me all around the world. And, and I'm excited to be here at Auburn and excited to lead the, the national team as well. 
Great. It sounds like a lot of timing and opportunity that all stems from your involvement with your uncle and the, and the start that you got in the sport. So no longer in Chicago, but no longer. no longer in Chicago, but in Auburn. Let's talk a little bit about your role. So the U.S. men's national team position led to your opportunity at Auburn University. You've been there since 2016. You are the first coach in the program's history. So what is that like starting a program, growing a program? Talk to me about some of the challenges and opportunities that that create creates being at the beginning of the building of the program. Yeah, so, I mean, our program started a few years before I got here, um, and we regularly started as a wheelchair tennis team. Uh, we had one student athlete on campus. It's easy to have a tennis team with one student athlete. It's hard to have a basketball team, which is one student athlete. Uh, and it kind of grew from there where we were able to add additional people into our program. So prior to my arrival, it was grad students that were running the team. Uh, and the grad student did a great job of helping to kind of get us started. Uh, but I was tasked coming in with not just growing the wheelchair basketball team, but growing our adapted sports in general. Uh, so really the biggest challenges or some of the biggest challenges that we have with starting a program or even starting a new program is uh, educating people about adapted sports. It, it's a little different uh, than the name, than uh, the able body running game that people are used to. Uh, so it's the education piece and and helping people understand that our student athletes are just as competitive as our able body counterparts. Um, and then it's working on the exposure as well to make sure that more people across campus know about our, ath our student athletes, about our sport, uh, and partnering with them to help us grow and, and push the outreach part of our program and really getting the powers that be to come out to a tournament to check us out, whether that is uh, advisors, uh, provosts, presidents, uh, people of power within the university that can help us with that change are the ones that we'd love to get out to the game. And, and we've been fortunate to have some great support from our university. Uh, we've had some great support from our athletic department. Uh, I know my counterpart on the, the men's team, Bruce Pearl, has come out and supported our team. Uh, so for us, that's that was our challenge at the beginning, and it, it's still a challenge today. Uh, I would love to be able to sell out the Beardies Memorial Coliseum. And by sell out, I mean our games are free. So anyone can come to our game for free. You know, our, our facility sits about twelve to thirteen thousand seats. You know, if, if we can get five hundred people at a game, that's that's huge for us. Uh, but that's where the outreach and the exposure piece really helps with that. And and the more we can get the students here at Auburn to buy into it, uh, the more we can get the families in the Auburn area to come out to the games, the better it'll be for our student athletes to play in front of a large fan base. Uh, but also helps with exposure to our sport. Um, because who knows, you may have someone in your family or you may know someone whose neighbor uh, has a kid with a disability, that this is a great avenue for them to get started in their adapted sports. You, you've talked about a lot of great details and, and maybe opportunities to get some key individuals in to promote the sports, as well as growing the fan base a little bit further. I would imagine being a Paralympic sport, that's probably helped provide some kind of education into the competitive nature of wheelchair basketball, but you, you emphasize that it, maybe it's still a little bit of a challenge. So what steps are you taking to help with that education to make sure that Auburn community at large understands that this is a great sport to watch? Yeah, I, I think it helps that uh, aside from my position here that I also coach the national team. Uh, and we we can use that to help uh, push and promote our team. But more important than that is uh, we currently have five athletes, student athletes within our program that are also part of the uh, U.S. national team pool of athletes. We had uh, three or four of them that were part of the under 23 national team that just competed this past year uh, at their zone qualifier. They won a gold medal uh, at world championships. They fell short of meddling. Um, and then we do have one of our athletes that was with the U.S. senior team this past year down in Brazil, where we won a gold medal down there. And I think it's important to have those athletes help with the education piece as well. Um, across campus, students get things done. Students are the ones that are seen more so than, uh, than the coaches and the faculty. 
Uh, so having uh, five student athletes have success on a national team level and be part of the national team pool really helps when it goes to uh, talking to different people across campus. It's one thing to talk about uh, my history with the national team, the success that I've had with the national team, but it means so much more when it's your student athletes that have a gold medal where, you know, hanging around their neck and they can speak to their experience. Uh, and we can show back to the Auburn family uh, how much it means for the Auburn students to have that experience on the national level. Let's talk about the opportunities and challenges that arise from you straddling coaching positions with Auburn and the national team. Oh, I'm, what, what do you mean challenges? It's, it's <laughs> easy to keep all the different balls in the at the same time. I mean, you're coaching five of these athletes, right, in, in both spaces. So, <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, really the, the challenges come down to is really time management and making sure that um, when I have to be focused on Auburn and the Auburn team and preparing for tournaments that that's solely my focus uh, but at the same time currently there's stuff going on with the national team as well that uh, we're dealing with uh, you know the budget for this next year and figuring out tryouts and training camps and this next year we have two major tournaments for the national team uh, one of them which will take place in November which is the middle of the Auburn season so how do we balance um tournaments for the Auburn team if I'm going to be out of the country I'm very fortunate that I've got a great staff that works with me and, and can cover for me when I'm out of town uh, but really it's trying to balance all those things at once uh, never mind the fact that you try to balance being uh, a husband uh, a father of two young boys that are involved in their own sports uh, so it, it's definitely a challenge there but that's where uh, making sure that the schedule is locked in and there's enough time built in for uh, family time and and uh, and everything else is important. But uh, it's I think it's one of those things where it's always a challenge and it's just about surrounding yourself with the right team, uh, both here at Auburn and on the national team and on the home front uh, to make sure that all responsibilities are taken care of. Sounds like a little bit of time management as well. And do any of your athletes get caught up in, in having a conflict with their schedule? Some of them that are performing on the, the national team and Auburn as well. So it, that did happen this past year with some of our U23 guys that went over to Thailand. That tournament was uh, near the beginning of the school year. So they missed, you know, two and a half to three weeks to go to Thailand and compete in that tournament. Great experience for them. Um, and their teachers here on campus were great about allowing them to, to make up their work later. I think only one of them had to take an exam while he was over in Thailand and he was able to do so. Uh, but being away for that long and missing class for that long, um, you know, set them back a little bit in their classes where it took them a while to make up in those for those classes. So and that's not just a concern here with with the guys at Auburn. It, it was a concern for any of the U23 guys that participated in that team. Uh, and quite honestly, is something that's in the back of my mind as we prepare for, um, you know, we have world championships coming up in June. Luckily, no uh, no school there for any of the guys. Uh, but November is the Parapan America Games down in Santiago, Chile. So uh, that's definitely a concern when it comes to selecting that team and making sure that if we do select any current uh, collegiate student athletes, that they have clear communication with their uh, advisors with their professors, with their grad student or with their grad assistants uh, to make sure that they are able to miss the amount of time that is going to be required uh, to participate on the national team. If not, the other option for them is they may have to look at taking the semester off from school. Uh, so that way it doesn't keep them from graduating or uh, impact their classes too much. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the, the, the time piece the, the cha is challenging for any student athlete, the traveling and the time away from, from the classroom. Now, collegiate sport is typically provided on a college campus through the athletics or recreation department. Wheelchair basketball at Auburn is a little different. They're under the Office of Accessibility. So what are the advantages and challenges with competitive wheelchair basketball kind of operating outside of athletics and recreation departments on a college campus? Yeah, I think it's one of those things that if you talk to all the different coaches within the collegiate division for wheelchair basketball, we're all kind of housed uniquely within our university in terms of whatever fits best. Some are within rec sports, some fall within club sports, 
Uh, others fall within their athletic department. Some smaller D3 schools fall within their athletic department. Uh, we're probably one of the few schools where uh, we're kind of away from sports altogether. We're part of the Office of Accessibility, so we roll up to the provost's office. Um, it, we we have a great relationship with the athletic department, and maybe someday we'll be part of Auburn Athletics. Uh, but where we're housed right now works really well for our program uh, in terms of the Office of Accessibility is there to support any student on campus that has any sort of uh, disability or needs any sort of accommodations. And uh, that's every single one of our student athletes. So um, anything that happens across campus that they need assistance with, that gets taken care of within the Office of Accessibility and they know all about our student athletes. Uh, you know, the, the other great part is that uh, within the Office of Accessibility, the Office of the Provost, it does give us exposure uh, to the Provost, to the Assistant Provost, uh, to people that sit up in Sanford Hall, the President. Um, so it allows us to have, I guess, closer exposure to those uh, individuals than we would if we were housed in a different area. Uh, and we get great support from the Office of Accessibility. It's, that's where Adapted Sports was born here at Auburn. Uh, we're very proud of the fact that we're housed within the Office of Accessibility. Our director and assistant director are very supportive of us, and uh, I think it would be a hard day for them if if we had to move on and, uh, and moved into the athletic department. But I think they also realize that as we continue to grow, uh, that that's probably the right place for us to grow into. But for now, uh, we love where we're housed and, and the support that we get. I would love to hear a little bit of a comparison of the the resources that are available to you under Auburn's model and under the national team model. So let's talk about facilities, financing, staff support. Talk to me, kind of compare and contrast. Obviously, I'm not sure there are comparable, but you know, what <laughs> what are you, what do you experience between these two different programs? Sure, I'll, I'll do my best to try to hit on each one that you talked about, uh, but I may forget something. So, so uh, jump on me if I miss sure. something. Sure. Well, from a facility standpoint, uh, here at Auburn, uh, I love the facility that we have. We're housed within the Beardies Memorial Coliseum, uh, which is uh, the basketball arena that Charles Barkley played in when he was here at Auburn. Uh, the men and women's team moved up to the Neville Arena about 10 years ago, uh, 12 years ago, I guess. And that's when we slid into the facility here. So we've got a massive, well, I mean, when you hear the word Coliseum, it's not a small building. It's it's a massive building and, and within the walls here, but we've got a locker room for the team. We've got our own strength and conditioning facilities here in the team um, and our athletic training office here uh, is in the building as well. So for our guys, the Coliseum is is a one stop shop for everything that comes uh, or that has to deal with a basketball standpoint with the national team. Somewhat the same, a little bit different. Uh, we try to do most of our training out in Colorado Springs at the Olympic and Paralympic Training Center out there. Uh, and once you get on site there, everything is taken care of. You've got basketball courts, uh, you know, top of the line fitness equipment in the Ted Stevens uh, uh, building. Um, you know, there's housing there. There's dining option there. Some of the best food in the world you can eat uh, is in the dining facilities there. Uh, so you, you, I mean, you're treated like an Olympic and Paralympic athlete when you're out there in Colorado Springs. Uh, we've also gone out to Lake Placid and trained at the training center out there. Uh, and then there's a training center up the road in Birmingham, Alabama, Lakeshore Foundation that will do training camps there as well. So from a facility standpoint, uh, court, weight room, athletic training, uh, it's not quite what we have here at Auburn is not quite national team level, uh, but it's not that far off either. Uh, and our student athletes, you know, they're, they're residents here. They've got their own dorm or apartments here. Uh, the food can be top notch if they want it to be, or it can be a bag of ramen. It's whatever they decide to uh, <laughs> to make that day. So it's it's really up to them. So uh, the Coliseum that you play in at, at Auburn is a bit of a an older facility. I think it was built in 1969, I believe. And uh, talk to me about accessibility challenges in that space. I mean, you're a team that needs accessible spaces. Has it been modified and updated to accommodate the needs of your athletes and your spectators? Yeah, that's, that's the great thing about being housed within the Office of Accessibility and where we're at. You know, they if there's anything that's not accessible either here in the building or at any classroom that our students go to, the Office of Accessibility works to make sure that, that things are accessible uh, for our student athletes. So yes, 
Uh, the building here is accessible. The court is accessible. Uh, on the outside, we've got ramps that uh, you know spectators or, or even uh, our student athletes can push up to the top if they want to sit up top. And every now and then we do conditioning out there on those ramps. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, everything here in the facility is accessible uh, to them. Uh, our weight room is accessible. The locker room is accessible. So yeah, we've we've made the accommodations here on campus to make sure that what our student athletes need. Uh, they have, and they feel uh, as as they should be as true student athletes here on campus, not student athletes with a disability. So compare to uh, compare for us the the funding model and opportunities between the two programs. Yes, yeah, this is where it kind of uh, diverges just a little more. Um, you know, with the with the national team, uh, most of our funding, just about all of our funding, comes from. The United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee. Uh, they fund our program for the year. Um, uh, and that funding goes to most of our funding there covers travel. Uh, that's where the bulk of our expenses are from a national team. And, and even when we get to Auburn, we'll talk about that too. But uh, it's not cheap to fly everybody in for our training camps. It's not cheap to fly to Dubai for a tournament or down to Chile for a tournament later this year. Um, so that's where the, the bulk of our expenses go. Um, and it's quite honestly the same way here at Auburn. Um, you know, our funding comes from the Office of Accessibility. Uh, we also do different fundraisers throughout the year. We try to find different sponsors to help offset some of the expenses, but we're in the same boat. Uh, we don't we don't fly to our tournaments here at Auburn. We bus everywhere we go. Um, so we've got some close bus rides, you know, three hours to Tuscaloosa. Uh, our next closest is about eight hours up to Champaign, Illinois. Uh, and then we get to our some of our longer bus rides, which are about 15 hours long. Uh, but that's where the bulk of our expenses come is traveling to tournaments. You have your bus expense, your hotel expense, your food expense. Um, and then we've got other odds and ends here, uh, equipment expense in terms of getting spare parts for the guys. So, uh, yeah, the, the, the budgets are a little different, a uh, little bigger from a national team standpoint, but we've got the opportunity uh, here at Auburn to raise additional funds through fundraising, uh, through sponsors to try to, I guess, close the gap between us and the national team. Uh, but, you know, I think the national team is always seen in in a brighter light with it being the national program. Different funding, but different funding models. The travel yeah. piece is really interesting because you have athletes that need their competitive wheelchairs, and then you have some athletes who have a personal wheelchair as well. Talk to me logistics. How do you get athletes and all their equipment that they need to the different competitions that they're traveling to? Yeah, so with uh, with the team here at Auburn, if you play Tetris growing up, we do a lot of Tetris when it comes <laughs> to loading the bus. You know, we've got those giant bays under the bus where we've got to store not just their competition chairs, but also their their everyday chairs, plus luggage, plus any other equipment that we need to bring with. So. Uh, I've got a great support staff that uh, has mastered the skill of turning chairs or taking wheels off. So our chairs, our competition chairs don't break down into nice small little boxes. They stay the same rigid size. So what we can do is we can take the wheels off, but that's about as much as you can take off the chair. So uh, a lot of trial and error at the beginning, but we figured out how to make that work. Uh, now, from a national team standpoint, that's where it gets a little tricky uh, our team leader does a great job of communicating with our airlines before we fly to training camps or tournaments, uh, mostly tournaments when we have to notify them that, hey, the national team is traveling on this flight. We're going to have, um, you know, we'll have a total of 17 or 18 people. We're going to have a total of 24 to 25 wheelchairs, uh, depending on how many extra competition chairs some of our guys bring. Uh, and that early communication with the airlines really helps out because there's been times where they've had to bring bigger planes with bigger cargo areas to hold all of our chairs. Uh, but if we're just trying to get together for a training camp, two or three guys can be on the same flight and there shouldn't be an issue from a, a, a transportation of chair standpoint. So Auburn, does that impact where you travel to competitions so you can take a bus rather than an airplane, something that is a little closer in proximity, or is your opportunity to travel for competitions unrestricted? Uh, so our opportunity is unrestricted. Um, however, for the ease of the team, we try to stay within 
probably no more than a 14 or 15 hour bus ride. It's not that we're opposed to, to flying. We just don't have a regional airport here in Auburn. So we would be having to take a bus to Atlanta, fly from Atlanta to wherever that competition is, get rental vehicles or another bus. So the logistics of it is just a little more of a challenge uh, where it's just easier if we can jump on a bus, fall asleep and wake up in Columbia, Missouri, you know, 12 hours later. If yeah. you can sleep on a bus. <laughs> Absolutely. Having no local airport, that kind of makes things a little more challenging for sure. Um, still 14, 15 hours. That's a long, that's a long bus ride. And the recruiting of athletes, talk to me about recruiting. So I know some teams recruit international students, others are recruiting the Paralympic athletes. What's your philosophy when it comes to recruiting for, for Auburn? Sure. So as a national team coach, I want to be able to recruit and develop young U.S. talent, high schoolers that are here in the U.S. I'd love to bring them down to Auburn uh, and teach them what it takes to play on the national team and play at that level. So for me, I'll go out to different junior tournaments throughout the country. I usually stick around here to the southeast, but I'll go to the national tournaments and, and meet different athletes that way. Uh, every summer, we host a summer camp here on campus, which is a great opportunity for any high school athlete to come to Auburn uh, I, I, what I tell them is it's like a test drive in a car. It's an opportunity for you to come down here for three to four days. You're able to see if you and I vibe from a, from a student athlete to coach perspective, but it also gives you an opportunity to check out campus really inexpensively while you're playing basketball. And you can see uh, whether you see yourself fitting in here at Auburn, whether Auburn is a place that you see uh, somewhere where you can call home for the next four to five years. Uh, so that's kind of one way that recruiting happens. But also we have kids from across the country that reach out to us throughout the year expressing interest and want to know inf more information about Auburn or more information about our summer camps. And that's how we begin to develop relationships with those kids as well. Are you able to provide scholarships for athletes to compete at Auburn? We do have uh, a pool of scholarship money. Uh, we're definitely not swimming in money and, uh, and offering out full ride scholarships to anyone uh, as of yet. Uh, but that's always one of our goals is to get to that point. So we're raising money for scholarships. We do have some scholarships to offer out to uh, to student athletes, but not nearly as much as, as they think or as much as they would like. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'd love to hear a little bit more um, about the uh, COVID impact that you've had. You mentioned delays in tournaments, um, things being rescheduled, but how did this impact both uh, your team at Auburn and the national team. Yeah, I mean, that, that COVID year here at Auburn and here with our, I, I guess, our collegiate program was one that was kind of up and down all season. Again, a lot of it fell back into where was that college program housed? You know, we we're very fortunate that we had the support from Auburn to continue to play that year, but there are other colleges that didn't compete that year. So their athletes were on campus, they were training, uh, but they didn't have the opportunity to play in games, which I know was frustrating for many of them. Um, for our guys, we were able to compete. We we played through the rules of having to wear masks on the sideline and you know sit six feet apart and COVID test before every tournament. So our guys were a trooper that year, just going through all, all the protocols. Um, and, and I think we became a stronger team because of it. We got an extra year to be able to compete, even if we only competed against two teams the whole the whole year. Um, but but our guys enjoyed being able to play from a national team standpoint. You know, it, it pushed Tokyo back a year, which threw a wrench into a lot of people's plans that were planning on retiring. Um, and the postponement of Tokyo then postponed, um, you know, our zone qualifier that was supposed to take place in 2021 got pushed back to early this year in 2022. A world champ, or sorry, this past year, 2022. Uh, our world championships was supposed to take place this past November that got impacted and shifted back another year. Uh, so it really compounded everything. Um, and it really impacted a lot of guys on the team that wanted to retire. Some of them are thinking about retiring or not retiring. Um, and then all the different protocols we had to go through traveling to different countries and the COVID testing we had to do beforehand. And, uh, do we need to get vaccinated? Should we get vaccinated? Is it required to be vaccinated to go to Tokyo? Uh, that played into a lot of guys' decisions in terms of uh, what direction they wanted to go. And then once we were in Tokyo, 
it was COVID testing every single day. Um, and then as we got near the end of the tournament, there was a COVID scare within uh, the men's pool that forced our guys to go through some more stringent testing from a COVID standpoint. Um, so it was nice to win a gold medal and kind of put, uh, you know, a, a nice finish to the tournament, uh, a nice finish to an extra year that really stretched on for the guys. Wow. This persevering through all that adversity and those challenges. That's amazing. Well, Rob, we really appreciate your time. Are there any final parting things that we should know about wheelchair basketball that you think it's important for our viewers to understand? Well, I think it's one of those things that if you know someone that uh, has a disability, uh, wheelchair basketball may be their sport. It may not be their sport, uh, but reach out to someone within the wheelchair basketball community and they'd be able to help guide you in the right direction, uh, whether it's a, a disability that happened at birth or something that you acquired later on in life. Uh, I think everyone within the wheelchair basketball and the adaptive sports community is about making sure that opportunity is there for, for anyone. So if you're watching this and you have a disability and you're interested, reach out to me or anyone in your area and we'll do anything we can to help you get involved in the sport of your choice. But I, I want to thank you for having me on today and to share about Auburn wheelchair basketball and about the Paralympic team uh, and about everything that's going on from an adaptive sports standpoint. So thank you very much for that. Rob, it's amazing. I'm excited to see how your season will, will, will come out this year. So good luck as you're heading into that with your, your student athletes. And thank you for being here. Thank you and War Eagle. <laughs> this is the sports playbook and we appreciate Rob's insight on the wheelchair basketball collegiate and national team competition. So thank you to our viewers for joining us today. We'll see you again in a couple weeks. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.